So very briefly, uh, Mark Patterson is chairman and co-founder of Macklin Patterson Global Advisors, which manages over $9 billion worth of distressed funds. Mr. Patterson has 35 years of financial market experience and holds degrees in law, economics, as well as an MBA from NYU. Mr. Patterson serves on the board of directors of Allied World Assurance in Bermuda, Broadpoint Securities Group, Polymer Group, Thornburg Mortgage Incorporated, Flagstar Bank Corp, and on the Dean's Executive Board of the NYU's Jones School of Business. We are so pleased to have him here this morning, and without further ado, I'll thank pass you. it on to Mark. Mark, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm embarrassed to say I know about a third of the people in the audience, so uh, <laughs> I'll have to make a different speech than we prepared. Um, I was asked to just talk a little bit about uh, how, we, how we've gone in, into this mess, uh, what's been happening in the mess, and what comes out the other side in all probability. And about six, eight months ago, making this, having this little chat would have been dramatically easier with easy, high conviction as to where we're going. So the last part's going to be more, more open questions and a few conclusions I've drawn. Uh, I think that uh, where we are today is so dislocated from the uh, fundamentals of unemployment, GDP direction, and banking solvency that it's very, very hard to ha have high conviction about where the economy is going from here. Whereas in the middle of the disaster, it was quite easy to imagine with government intervention that things would get better soon. What we're going to talk about are these topics here, just quickly separating regular investing from distressed investing, a couple of sort of uh, paint-by-numbers stuff there. What causes distress most often? What, what sort of is going on in the current default cycle, uh, statistically that is, w w where we are in the cycle, how our little firm uh, approaches distressed investing, how we all got into this mess, uh, uh, a couple of causes. These are all my thoughts. These, uh, these are not attributable to our firm or to uh, anybody who lives in Bronxville. The, the, uh, the Marty Muir and I worked together years ago. He actually wrote this. Um, and, <laughs> We're, we're of, uh, we're, how we all got into the mess and then, then what sort of uh, distressed opportunities have shown up. Uh, how do we go to next? We're going to go next like this. Hold on. Uh, up, 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 up. There it goes. It just came back up on the, on the left. I got it. Uh, what, what opportunities? Opportunities meaning, uh, obviously, we, we live around the emergency wards of hospitals and gra graveyards and so on. So when we say opportunities, we mean companies that have just about died or are almost dying, right? Those are the most exciting things we can find. And we have a fiduciary obligation to do that on behalf of our LP. So we try to put a white shirt on all this process. Um, what are the biggest hurdles we're facing these days, and, and wh where do we go now? So the first thing, stocks, bonds, loans, commodities, derivatives, indices, everybody knows gen money markets, everybody knows generally about, uh, about uh, regular investing in the ordinary course. Distressed has become more sophisticated in the last 15 years as a subclass in private equity and, and the hedge fund space. So the first one, the least active one, is the non-control passive hedge fund manager with, uh, with, with an objective to buy a security and sell it later. The non-control activist, think of Carl Icahn, one of the great stand-up comedians, actually. You just don't want to be across the table from him when he's cutting a deal. He'll cut your head off. Uh, he, he is ruthless uh, and quite effective, and uh, uh, I'll stop there. The, the, uh, the, the, the U.S.-dominated or, or, or a Japan or, or an Asia-based distressed fund, meaning local uh, in its market, uh, looking for control uh, is more like a private equity firm, an LBO firm or a venture capital firm, but it's only buying, trying to accumulate uh, positions 
of control in distressed companies. And then what we do is we, we, we operate around the world, a couple of offices uh, scattered around the world, and we, try to, we have bought companies in 40 different countries. Uh, obviously, the legal systems are not quite as uh, efficient as the United States or Germany or England or Canada, but uh, risk-adjusted, you, uh, you can make a little bit of money. Uh, uh, we've, we've, we've done both, trust me. Uh, but we haven't invested in mainland China, Russia, Japan, South Africa, some decent economies out there that we've not controlled a company in where it's reasonable to expect we should have. Uh, mainly it's a corruption uh, issue for us. Um, so, meaning the, the, the local legal system so bad or the, or the uh, government officials are all so much on the take that it's not worth it. Uh, quick causes of distress, obviously simple credit erosion is the most obvious thing, a sort of a fallen angel, the, the, the GM and Ford and buggy whips or, 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 or industries that tend to have a, have a going away newspapers today, uh, a going away nature to them. The 20-year bond, 30-year bond issued never contemplated the, the company's erosion, and if you can turn that company around or buy it at a cheap enough price, it's worth getting involved. Litigation, obviously, is a huge cause of distress. Uh, everybody remembers the Texaco case uh, from not too long ago and uh, Bhopal Union Carbide when, when 2,300 uh, people were killed from a chemical explosion. Union Carbide was bankrupt in a week, uh, voluntarily, I mean, uh, to, to try to save the company. Uh, ambitious new corporate strategies, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but when you couple it with leverage, it's a pretty mean mixture and it often brings companies down. We bought quite a few like that. Uh, in the old days when local bond markets were almost non-existent in foreign countries, many countries, quite sophisticated countries, you'd, you'd get those companies issuing Yankee bonds, meaning living in Indonesia or Germany, they'd issue a dollar bond. If there's a deval, not going to be a deval on Germany, obviously, but more likely in Thailand in 1997 or Brazil or Mexico, you're going to have beautiful opportunities to buy those bonds in otherwise healthy companies that have just had a doubling or tripling of their debt overnight, unhedged. So that's a good, we bought the biggest, uh, APP is the biggest oil and, independent oil and gas company in Indonesia. PT Med goes the second biggest cell phone company in Thailand. And so we, we bought those things uh, back when, when I worked at Credit Suisse First Boston, uh, and we were doing this proprietarily just off the trading desk. Now we run capital as, a, as an arm's length fiduciary for uh, big state funds and sovereign wealth funds and so on. Um, failed uh, ex acquisitions for expanding companies often help us out, particularly when you uh, pop leverage in there. Fraud's a good friend of ours as long as it happens before we own the company. Uh, you know, <laughs> WorldCom, those kind of companies, uh, you know, uh, you recall they, they eventually got their numbers right. They, they, it was about a $9.3 billion fraud. They called them accounting adjustments. Uh, you always got to love it when a massive, successful company, the, the younger among us here, there are two of you, you just got out of Vanderbilt, wherever you are. There you are. And, and, and you at 25, 6. Uh, when, when people uh, tell you how white their shirt is, and they spend a lot of time telling you that, the CFO of WorldCom lived in a $120,000 home and, and told everybody who interviewed him that he did. When the fraud was uncovered, he was in the process of building a $23 million home under construction in Florida. You've got to love it. It's almost inevitable. There's no reason why that guy should not be living in a half-million-dollar home, even in Arkansas, in his position. So when he advocates over and over and over again that I live in my first little house and everything's cool and I've never done anything wrong, we get very suspicious. It, to, to be in distress, you've got to have a pretty cynical or inflective way about thinking about what people tell you, including the CEO of the company who you're trying to buy. Mostly because they're in such dire straits, they get worried that if they told you everything that was really bad and that was going on, you wouldn't buy them. We actually like that because it gets us a fair appreciation of what's, what has to be fixed and what chance we have to turn it around. Structural market shifts obviously uh, are a big reason for, for bankruptcy and change of credit quality. In the last year, the new kids on the block were systemic over leverage or bubbles, excessive bubbles that we've ju just been through and this massive bank insolvency problem uh, where you should expect four to 800 banks to fail. Uh, across the United States. When I came here about 30-something years ago, there were 13,500 banks, and I came from a country of nine banks, nine commercial bank licenses. So it was quite interesting to me to see this different fabric, different way of looking at life. Uh, all of us can start a bank, by the way. Sheila Baer is going to give you a hard, harder time this year than last year but uh, to get your license uh, approved. But you can start a bank with a million dollars of, 
of, uh, of capital and, and, and start a small community bank in America. With 100 million, you can, you can go crazy. But uh, uh, you know, we're down to 8,500 banks in the United States right now. So we're going to lose about 10% of the, the number of commercial banks. Citibank's obviously, anybody work for Citibank? Uh, so they're, they're, they're insolvent, obviously, right? The, uh, if you just do the math, their market capitalization was uh, at the peak was about $300 billion when they were levered insane, at an insane level. And uh, when they told the, the world they'd have 5, 10, or 15 billion of mistakes to write off uh, and they'd raise some sovereign wealth money and the, some top money and all this kind of stuff, that was about 45, 50 billion they raised. All right? And the stock was in the high 20s. I shorted it personally then. Uh, by the way, uh, just as the sovereign wealth funds came into it, because th- most big banks in trouble always tell you it's a small problem at the, at the, just before they reveal all the truth. And uh, you, you all recall the stock stopped dropping at 99 cents uh, from 28 or so. Uh, along the way there, the government's, U.S. government stepped in and, and guaranteed 90% of 300 billion, 305 billion of their bad assets. That's a $270 million guarantee. Just do the math. It's absolutely insolvent at the bottom of the crisis. What Pandit and the uh, team have done is basically, and with the government's help, obviously, and debt guarantees, been able to get the bank through this problem. UBS is a ward of the, of the, uh, of the Swiss government. Uh, RBS is owned, uh, Lloyd's is owned by the British government. RB, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland is owned. So we've had a pretty cataclysmic problem here with bank insolvencies. Uh, so let's not, uh, let, let's not take too lightly the, the credibility of the banking system, we, we have to be very careful about getting optimistic about the economy recovering when the banking system is still very, very frail around the world. This is just a very simple, you know, uh, paint by numbers sort of graph. It shows you that, that the cyclicality of the default rate is a pretty ugly thing. And it's probably worth focusing in on sort of 07, 08, rather than what most people would focus in, which is the spikes. Uh, you see how low the default rate was in 07 and 08. Normally, we see very, when you see prices of bonds and stocks and everybody collapsing on, toward a bottom is when you have these massive spikes like in 01, 02 in the default rate. So this time around, we just had a market panic, complete lack of uh, confidence. Everybody thought their home was going to be worth 20 cents. Uh, uh, you know, 10% of all of our friends have lost their jobs. This is a tough, tough uh, situation we went through, and the default rate is now catching up to, uh, to where... Uh, I believe, uh, to where it should have been before the prices all started to collapse. So what do we do? We, we're obviously try, kind of, we've got to be nimble in this business. It's a little bit frightening. Uh, it's not as orderly as buying PepsiCo buying a, a potato chip company. It's not as orderly as a KKR buying, a, a doing, executing a leverage buyout. We use two methods to get in. We either trade our way into the debt securities of these companies without talking to them. Nine out of ten times we don't meet the company before we try to buy 10 to 90% of their debt. We're not paying par. That's the price at which debt is issued in, in all debt instruments mostly. Uh, uh, we're trying to buy them between 5 and 40 cents on the dollar, those debt instruments. Quite often the junior debt instruments. Um, the, in a slower market, slower default environment, a more bold environment, you're not going to see a, ca- a climbing of that default rate and a collapse of bond prices. You, we're going to be negotiating just like everybody else does to try to buy the company, but it's more chaotic. It's more difficult to buy those companies. And generally, it has a smaller group of people trying to uh, get in the room to, to do the acquisition. In the CDMA business, which is the new technology that keeps your Verizon cell phone working, it's supplied by Nortel. Nortel's in bankruptcy in Canada. And here, we try to buy the CDMA business that was being sold at a price way too low, uh, we own 400 million of the bonds, 4 billion, the company's got 4 billion of bonds, 2.6 billion of cash, meaning it's not that bad uh, a setup, we didn't think, and they have a fabulous business in the CDMA technology that, uh, that Sprint and Verizon, but principally Verizon use. And so we jumped in the court there and tried to, try to see if we could motivate, uh, try to win it, obviously, buy the business, but motivate somebody else, one of the strategics in China, in, in, in Norway, or in Germany to, to buy it and pay a full price. We got them to pay up from 650 to, to a billion three, a billion one three, excuse me. So we didn't get the company, but there were only four people in that court bidding for the company. So that's a much more efficient way to go after companies than we're having 60, 70 strategics or LBO firms running around uh, a particular acquisition. By the way, they, you know, they have audited numbers, but they have no credibility in Canada. They, they've, they've got some catastrophic uh, continuous problems 
in ma management strategy and all those sort of things. So it needed a cleanup. Trust me, Nortel is not a, a, a pretty picture. But our, our business is, is sort of built around a lot of complexity, a, a lot of unknowns, uh, due diligence often from the outside in, whereas every leverage buyout or strategic acquisition is done from the inside out. So Bruce Wasserstein's team at Lazard goes out, Goldman Sachs goes out, puts the blue book together to sell PepsiCo to somebody. Uh, obviously, that's a narrower group of people who can afford something that big, but they put the book together, and it's all the public information and all the private information, best information that Pepsi wants to put out to be able to market the company at the highest possible price. We never see that blue book. We encourage the bankers not to show it to us because it implies that there's a wide array of people trying to look at it, which means we shouldn't be looking at it. It's not sick enough yet. So um, normally the, the information's moving very fast. Uh, you know, it, took, it took WorldCom about uh, six months to actually admit to the $9.3 billion uh, of fraud. They, they only owned up to 2.8 on the first announcement. So you can get clobbered by jumping in and buying something at 10 cents uh, uh, on the dollar down from par and finding out that they have more good news to share with the public, and that drives the price down further. We, we've got to be comfortable changing, uh, changing management. Even when we make the mistake of appointing people who are not up to that particular job, we've got to change them again. Uh, in family companies, you don't have that flexibility. If you've teamed up with John Huntsman and his family to buy Huntsman Chemical, it's very, very difficult to ask John Huntsman or Peter Huntsman, his son, to leave the company. So when you, when you team up with a family company, you better be sure you've got the right management capability and the right commitment on their part because you've kind of partnered up with them. We obviously leverage, like LBO firms, we leverage consultants and board members and people we know in the business. Um, and our, the way out of this business, if you're a hedge fund manager and you buy 10 million of the 4 billion, 5 to 10 million of the 4 billion of Nortel's paper, your, all, your intention is not to affect anything. It's to hope that it comes back, your analytics were pure, and you can, the bo comes back meaning the bond price moves up a little bit, and then you sell it for t your 10 million for 12 or 15 million someday later. What we have to do once we've accumulated 30, 50, 90 percent of the debt of that company is exchange it into control of the whole company, uh, the, the new, new equity that gets issued by the company when it comes out of bankruptcy, sit on the board, uh, always members of our firm sit on the board. We appoint a majority of the board typically, uh, but our way out is not selling 12, 10 million for $12 million of, of bonds. We've bought bonds, we've ended on bank loans and other instruments, and we've ended up with equity. We have to sell it outright in a, in a whole company sale or an IPO or a series of secondary offerings. If these buzzwords are too quick for, for some who are not as deeply into the uh, finance world, sort of raise a hand and ask for an explanation if I hop through a word too quickly. But uh, to get all of this into 30 minutes, uh, I practiced it four times and an hour and a half was the least I got it done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so how did we all get into this mess? The, the way I look at it is that we got three substantial contributors, and, and if you all disagree with this, that, that's even better. I, I'm just trying to prompt you to get, uh, you know, to get scared. The, the, if you look at the correlation between uh, uh, inflation rate in, in America and home inflation rates for 60 years, obviously there's minor variability around those two numbers, but they're effectively, the, the, the standard, you know, the, uh, the R squared, the residual difference between the two is tiny for a long, long period of time. 60 years, even, at, I'm almost 60, you, 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 it's a good set of data. You can rely on that data. From the mid-90s, it started to separate a little bit. Which one do you think parted? Which one went up higher than the other? Regular inflation or the price of your house? Right. Wow, everybody's still awake. So uh, it, it started to drift up a little bit on the housing side, and, and you, you know, the economists write a few boring articles about it and that kind of stuff, but nobody really pays attention until it gets pretty scary. Somebody in California who invests with us, a high net worth guy in, in Santa Barbara, sent me an article uh, that, uh, that showed that the, the, the cumulative price differ differential, the, the, uh, the uh, inflation differential on ho homes, not just your homes, not Br Greenwich, Bronxville, or Santa Barbara. You could take little homes, middle homes, Mac Mansions, any layer of the community, and the pricing levels of the rate of growth of your house was about 45% higher than the inflation rate. Now, it doesn't take a mathematical genius to figure out there are only two cures, if you believe in revision, er, er, mean reversion, 
That means if you're really a mean person. No, no. It means <laughs> that, that data tends to correlate. The history repeats itself. Over some, some, with time, history repeats itself. So uh, it, with, with mean reversion, you would expect either to have massive other inflation than housing, and inflation would catch up to this, this, this terrifyingly high home price inflation uh, line, or there's going to be a price collapse. Okay, so I don't think it takes a lot of uh, PhDs in the room to figure out which one's more likely to happen than the other, but it's still a probability game <clears throat> until you get down, uh, if you throw in the leverage game, and, what, and the last point on this slide, what people did with the proceeds of that price appreciation. But to me, it was a, a foregone conclusion, and that's why you short Citibank or, or, or the banking sector as a whole, mortgage companies as a whole, turn that upside down. That's why our firm goes shopping in that emergency ward. It's very likely to have a lot of accidents in that area. So the subprime lending, as if it's not bad enough that home prices have become, the price of appreciation in homes has become dislocated from regular inflation. This is the United States observation, of course. Um, <clears throat> but subprime lending started by uh, uh, Clinton and passed, uh, fully endorsed by uh, Bush in, in all of his eight years was to move the, the world's highest percentage home ownership ratio, 61%, uh, as high as we could get it. It got up to about 69%. All of that 8% was in subprime lending. Subprime is a long form of saying for all those Americans who can't ordinarily under ethical conditions own a house. Mathematically, they cannot afford to own a house. That's why they rent. So what we did, if you go to a friend of mine went uh, from head of risk management worldwide for uh, J.P. Morgan to go work for, for Fannie, uh, and in his first meeting, he saw the statistical uh, evidence on the inside of what was happening at Fannie, and it was already bankrupt, obviously. Uh, and he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. we're going to go down, not just because we're so ugly and leveraged already, but we have this sort of put to the government. Let's ignore that. The quality of the assets we're accumulating, particularly subprime, is going to kill this institution in a year or two. We have to cease making those loans now, not, not slow down the rate of growth. Just stop it immediately and see if we've uh, caught it quickly enough. And they laughed him out of town and said, this is DC. This is a political agenda. We have to do this. This is what, uh, this is what the, the White House expects out of, out of Fannie. This is hypothetically an arm's length business model where people are getting paid bonuses to manage it and all that stuff. So there's a very sick, sick thing. It's only, it's a small thing too, a trillion dollars, right? The U.S. mortgage market's a $13 trillion game at the top, if you don't count defaults, of the last year and a half. $13 trillion game, a trillion of this stuff. Put it another way, it was about half a percent of the all American mortgages. It grew to 12 and a half percent, proportionately. So we, an eighth of all the American mortgages became subprime uh, non-collectible mortgages. Pretty spooky number. Uh, excessive leverage generally. If it, it is safe to have a bank, just accept this for now, a bank with 10 times leverage or a dollar of equity for every nine or ten dollars of assets. It's a pretty, worldwide, is a pretty safe thing to do. If, you, if you're a well-capitalized bank, uh, the rules today, uh, uh, financial rules say it's five percent as a well, in America, say, say it's a, 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 a well-capitalized bank that's, that's obviously more than 10%. Uh, that's, uh, that's not a, uh, it's more leverage, I mean, than, uh, than 10 times. It's 20 times. So the great banks are 8 to 9 to 10 times uh, uh, the 10% capital. Uh, I'll get it right in a second. Or 8 to 9 to 10 times levered as, a, as, a, as a, just a, a fact of survival. We had our big American banks, Goldman Sachs, Lehman, Morgan Stanley, all those kind of guys, all the top flight players were running along at 30 to 35 times levered and maintaining some of the top, top credit ratings in the world. CIVs, uh, uh, the structured investment vehicles, uh, Crittenden was the CFO of Citibank at the time. I just remember awarding him in our quarterly letter to the LPs. Uh, he and one other guy, sort of a, the, the quote of the year for, for stating in Barron's that uh, uh, these are non-recourse instruments. They'll never come back on our balance sheet. Two months later, they, they brought about 60 billion of them back onto the balance sheet. How much equity is in a structured investment vehicle? Virtually none. So you're parking leverage off the, you're manufacturing the assets on the trading floor or the capital market side, and you're taking them and parking them off your balance sheet and creating an income stream into the bank. It's a very levered way to make good returns. It's also a very scary way 
to go about your business. Uh, Japan did the same thing with leasing companies, le levered 100 to 1. You only need, on a $100 billion balance sheet, you need 1 billion of mistakes, and you've wiped the place out. So uh, you need a 1% default rate to blow the place up. It's not a very high <coughs> default rate in credit terms in the bottom of a cycle. So the risk was getting insane. Fannie, Freddie, if you look at them combined, or individually rather, they both were operating between 120 and 130. Direct leverage, and if you can count their guarantees of mortgages as their liability, and they're all of your liabilities, by the way, because they have a, a, today they have an explicit, but they've always had a, a subliminal uh, guarantee of the U.S. government, even though you could buy the stock. Uh, you and I could get rich or poor on the stock. <clears throat> they were operating at about 120 times leverage, and derivatives, how much equity is in, uh, standing behind AIG or Credit Suisse or uh, Goldman Sachs' derivative book? Zero. It's not, it's not an insurance contract that is, but it's not, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not regulated by the insurance uh, commissioners of the various states, and the banks similarly were required to put up no equity for these contracts. So that, on a notional basis, don't worry about the number because it's notional, but it's, it got up to about $63 trillion of contracts flying around the world in that space. So let's say you wash out a lot of the offsetting trades. Maybe it was still a $10 trillion market with no, uh, no equity behind it, no, no hard reserved equity. Sort of insane, and, and the regulators are trying to dive into that. Other factors. All of us have tried to get a good education and, and, and get ahead of the peasant uh, sort of uh, uh, level of, of, of the community, but it's really important to remember the value of peasant logic or common sense. All the great statisticians, all the great model builders, none of them can ever tell you when to take your foot off the accelerator. This is too much. This is too excessive. The fact that a very leveraged deal or a very risky deal cleared the market yesterday is no guarantee that today's deal, slightly more aggressive, makes any common sense. So you need people away from the model builders and the statisticians and the mathematicians to just say, this is too much risk. And there were very, very, very few people in the greed cycle uh, who had the courage to step up and say, it's time to slow down. The psychology of successful greed and, and permanent growth, we all, you know, life is cyclical. Good news, bad news sort of comes and goes. So, uh, you know, believing it could always perpet in perpetuity go, go on uh, was a little bit naive for all of us. Uh, we've talked about the absence of derivatives and there's no clearinghouse for derivatives, so the likelihood of a knock-on or a domino effect in derivatives was massive. And if anybody believes that uh, J.P. Morgan bought uh, Bear Stearns because they were next door or the headquarters were next door, or the <laughs> J.P. Morgan had 13 billion, trillion of uh, derivative exposure across the street. J.P. Morgan would go down if the government didn't step up and make sure that one of the best houses in the, in the country was uh, preserved. So th these are spooky things happening live time as we're speaking, you know, as we're living through this stuff. Uh, another little example quickly, Morgan Stanley. Remember the Japanese Mitsubishi uh, IFJ put a whole bunch of money, three, five billion dollars into, into Morgan Stanley over that one weekend? At 32 bucks a share was the... Uh, strategic, you know, favorable price to get the money in to, to, to Morgan Stanley. What do you think Morgan Stanley's price of the stock that you and I could buy closed on the Friday that that deal was being finalized over the weekend? Anybody have a clue? In dollars. In, in dollars? Six. Bingo. Anybody think we should, you know, the, the board of Mitsubishi IFJ shouldn't have been sued? <coughs> It's not, a, it's not a commercial transaction is the point I'm trying to make. It's a rigged deal between treasuries that owe each other a favor, U.S. Treasury and the Japanese Treasury. The finance ministers have said, we are not going to let Morgan Stanley go down. This is, this is how it's going to work. So they took, as a, as a show of good faith, obviously, the U.S. Treasury, Hank Paulson at the time, moved the price down of Morgan Stanley's investment from uh, Mitsubishi IFJ from 32 to 26. I thought it was kind of cute. It was exactly the full market capitalization. The discount they benefited from was actually the stock price of Morgan Stanley. If, if Prudential had put that money in or the state of New Jersey's pension fund, the CIO, chief investment officer, would have been fired the next morning. So you can see that a lot of crazy things were, were being done to sustain the system at the bottom. Uh, and uh, the last point I'd leave you just with, as a thought is that we all lived, we thought we lived in an ATM and not a house. Substantially, people, remember your second mortgages and every four HELOCs, you know, home equity loans, 
uh, uh, every form of, of uh, growth in people's uh, homes was used uh, to finance mainly play rather than investment. <clears throat> this is just the quickest way that I can think of depicting the $767 billion uh, uh, congressional line of attack to help the economy. That was the surface number, right? This is the real number, and I think I'm low. When the U.S., we would have all lost our homes, our jobs, our careers. We would have had a, a 1929 uh, crash times about three, in my estimate, had the government not stepped in. So as a vibrant uh, uh, capitalist, I can tell you I still believe it was necessary to have the U.S. government intervene. But all these little codes, you and I don't remember all of them, but TARP is one that most people remember, the TLGP, Temporary Loan Guarantee Program. What do you think that was for? That was for Goldman Sachs. That was for, uh, that was for uh, GE Capital, little, little double A, triple A names like that, that could not issue short-term debt, one, two, and three-year debt. So the, the government stood behind them. I scared a lot of people, but when the minister leaves the room, it's pretty spooky. <laughs> like most of us at the bottom, he, he just lost faith. But... But uh, TALF was, you know, announced as 200 in the same sentence as a trillion. So you know it's a trillion dollar program, the one in the middle there. So <clears throat> the good news is right now we're backing off from some of these things. Uh, you can read in the papers today about some of these uh, sort of uh, purchases of bad loans, that two of them, two $500 million deals that are getting done, which is almost co comical. But uh, for those old enough in the room to remember the 1988-89 disappearance of Drexel Burnham, you had a, 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 and a and the SNL crisis. You had a, a huge amount of bad assets that need, need to, needed to get swept into a basket quickly, over time, sold off to others, uh, uh, and that was called the RTC. Uh, we still don't have an RTC, and we have a cataclysmic crash of of, of value and of, of securities confidence that needed a bad asset trash can like the RTC. We still don't have it. But maybe it, wasn't, it wouldn't have been good enough and couldn't have been effective enough, quickly enough, and this was the only solution. This doesn't include China, Germany, England. Or, this is just in America. We threw $7 trillion of American reinforcements, money reinforcements, at this problem. Anybody? I know you'll have the answer. Uh, what was the size of the, uh, of the Fed's balance sheet when we went into this uh, crisis? Anybody remember? About 980. Call it a trillion for government work. It is government work. I remember the guy, uh, Kuwait invests with us, and this little Arab guy says to me, he said, gee, do you see this article on the top of the, uh, the Wall Street? He said, I never knew Kuwait has more dollars than the U.S. Fed. So, <laughs> which I thought was kind of cute. You know? And this guy's this big, he's 25 years old, and he's you know, running around with more money than you can spell. Anyway, but, but, but he... he uh, it was a kind of a wake-up call to me that w here we are with a trillion-dollar coat of armor ready to face this big, big, whatever series of events are going to happen. Another man from the ministry. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, what's going to happen here is we need more reinforcements. That, that balance sheet grew to about two and a half trillion in this, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, liquefaction of the game. What, what is... Uh, what, is, what has shown up so far? Obviously, all of these initial layers you're, you've read about many times, subprime, uh, mortgages collapsed, all forms of mortgages eventually got infected, uh, monoline insurance companies that were really dual-line insurance companies. The monoline business is good, healthy, uh, a muni bond wrapping business with your AAA coat of armor, great, great business. It's slow moving, it's slow growth, buy the stock, you fall asleep. When they tell you they've got a rock and roll show going on in the basement, they forgot to, you know, got damn good noise proofing going on so you don't know. They're wrapping all those sieves and those structured vehicles, CDOs and stuff, with the same AAA. And now it becomes a rock star game. That stock starts to fly and everything's cool. Problem, all the monoline insurance companies went belly up in an instant. We talked to about half of them. We found one of them that looked like about a $5 billion hole in their balance sheet, meaning new capital they needed. Their presentation to us was five to seven hundred million. Completely delusional. Did not understand the severity of their problem. We don't want to invest with people like that. Because the, if they can't get a joke that big, and they think it's this big, we're very likely to lose our money. 
So that, that business has really gone through a big shake, shake up. Home builders, we bought the 10th biggest one called Standard Pacific. Anything I say about what we buy or don't buy, please, I'm not recommending those. So you should probably short the stuff. But, uh, you know, uh, we, we, uh, it's, it's very, very precarious when you're buying these kind of companies at the time we buy them. But we bought the 10th biggest home, home builder, and we'll see how it does uh, over time. What's the biggest supply of housing today? In, 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 who's the biggest home builder supplier in the, in the country today? It's foreclosures. Every bank that moves against a foreclosed home has to get rid of that home and they offered back in the market. We're living through the highest supply by a, by a multiple of foreclosed homes, and it's not over. Long way from being over. That cycle of foreclosure has probably got about two to three years to, to, to work through the economy. Choke loans, these, uh, I used to do this. I was an LBO, uh, sort of a capital markets guy, ran, ran leverage finance at a couple of firms uh, on Wall Street. But the game was to encourage Steve Schwarzman or Dave Bonham or Henry Kravis to believe we would put the residual of what we couldn't sell, distribute, of the loans and bonds back on our balance sheet if we couldn't move the bonds. That and of course, he knew and I knew that we were going to put very little on our balance sheet. That was the dance. This developed into a business where the bankers actually got approval to acquire five billion, twelve billion of loans and bonds and put them on their balance sheet before they'd even tried to distribute them. So the risk moved onto these balance sheets in a big way. When the game stopped, when the music stopped, there was 310 billion of these junk bond and loans and, 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 and bonds on the, ba on the bank's balance sheets. Pretty scary number that obviously uh, severely affected the solvency of all of the big players in the business. Biggest players in this business would be Citi, B of A, uh, uh, JP Morgan, Credit Suisse, UBS, all the Deutsche Bank, those kind of players. Goldman, Morgan Stanley. Civs, SIVs, we touched on before, the commercial banks, very weak, broker dealers, very weak. First Albany, every, anybody ever remember First Albany, little teeny brokerage firm about this big? Had 38 million in revenues when we bought it. Has a billion dollar market cap today. So it's two and a half years old. We bought it, we put a, 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 a bit of a thug in, in, in charge of it. Uh, number sort of three guy at Payne Weber in the old days. Uh, Lee Fenster stock, if anybody knows him. And he's made some fabulous acquisitions. We just bought Gleach's business recently and all this sort of stuff. Uh, but, but there was a moment when the big, f fabulous broker-dealers that we all grew up with in America, well, there are only really two big ones left. They're not commercial banks, you know that, uh, Morgan Stanley and, 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 and uh, Goldman. <clears throat> but the little guys could operate in this crazy meltdown uh, without ha having any disadvantage by having a small balance sheet or not being able to underwrite a lot. They could distribute securities basically risklessly, and we built that mortgage business and fixed income business up and uh, put a restructuring group together for this massive default cycle uh, inside Broadpoint. And so it's, it's an interest. Look, it's still a tiny little company. You know, Goldman Sachs makes more money before lunch on a given day than we make in the year uh, in revenues, trust me. But... Uh, uh, it's kind of cool to be able to pick up something that's largely going extinct. It's largely going to disappear and, and, and uh, revitalize it. Uh, what's good news, the third last bullet point, is that we've come through that financial and housing-related, mortgage-related cycle of, of catastrophe into real companies now. Chemicals, newspapers, yellow pages, radio, cable TV companies, uh, all forms of a Fomex. We just bought this little foam. You're sitting on our product probably. Your car seat has it, the mattresses, a uh, billion dollars uh, in sales and about a billion two in debt before it went into bankruptcy. First time, second time, it came out with about 500 million of debt. Uh, it has 35 million of debt on it now uh, under our structure, meaning we don't trust the banks to do the right thing uh, over the next year or two with, with uh, extending uh, the financing and stuff like that. Secondly, uh, you know, the companies clearly can't sustain in this kind of economy uh, a lot of interest burden, so we've largely eliminated the debt on the company. We'll see if it survives. We think it will. Nortel, we try to, uh, we try to buy that, uh, have not succeeded. Um, so what are the biggest hurdles we're all facing? The, system, sis, the risk of systemic failure is behind us. This is not an announcement, it's just a, a, a idle speculation, but I think the U.S. government has put a put behind the major financials and they will not allow them to fail. They actually said something much more bold. They won't even buy the equity of these banks, uh, but they'll make sure they survive. Everybody's aware they own 34% of Citibank. So then the, the announcement was we will not buy a majority of any major bank. 
So what they're trying to say is all of us get our confidence back up so we don't have to be doing these things. They will do those things to make sure that your house isn't worth $200,000 instead of a million dollars. So expect the government to be very um, uh, extremely alert to stepping back in with massive rescue operations if needed. But watch what's happening to CIT. That's very instructive. I, I know it's destructive if you own the stock or some of the bonds, but we own in our hedge fund, we own some of the bonds. But you, you, what's happening there is the government is comfortable enough standing back and letting CIT file for bankruptcy if it needs to. If this bond exchange doesn't work, CIT is filing for bankruptcy. That's a good sign. That's a healthy, normal thing that should happen. It's a very big company, so if you're a Jeff Peek or, or, or Alex Mason, you're not happy, the CEO and the, and the president. You're not a happy guy, but the bottom line is it's the right normal thing to happen versus Chrysler GM being processed through the White House instead of through a bankruptcy court. So you know, we, we've got to get away from government running, the, literally running companies and, and appointing CEOs and things like that. And I think we've passed the point where we're going to have a systemic meltdown. Uh, you know, the U.S. government in that $7 trillion slide has really kick-started a bunch of markets. Some of them are, are active, some of them are only mildly active, but we are a mile away from having an active securitization market for credit cards, car loans, uh, mortgages, prime mortgages, meaning uh, jumbo mortgages, I mean, the big ones, above what Fannie and Freddie buys, uh, uh, almost, almost fast asleep. That market doesn't exist today. Um, corporate defaults have really only just begun, so we, we're expecting a longer default cycle, not a spike and off, but a sort of ugly, long, protracted period. Um, when you're an investor, trying to understand fundamentals of a company and an industry is hard enough to do. When you have massive government intervention, it can completely uh, diametrically change the conclusion that you might have drawn under free market conditions. So, we find investing in the hedge fund side very difficult in this environment. You can have the carpet whipped out from under you very, very quickly by, by a government uh, uh, phase of intervention that you're not an anticipating. Um, I think the way we look at life is that U.S. bankruptcies in this cycle are going to be very large in dollar terms, but are going to weigh, from a risk, uh, risk return point of view, are going to weigh outweigh the, uh, are going to be far more attractive in the United States than most of the foreign countries. We own a wholesale uh, pharmaceutical distributor in, in, in Korea. We own a, a sort of subprime lender in, uh, in, uh, in, in Spain. And so we have made some investments, but they're very small compared to the capital we've deployed in the States. And, uh, you know, I said this in the opening remarks, the, this post-March, February-March was about the worst since then, we've seen a massive ride, in, positive ride in bond prices, stock prices, and bank loan prices. Those prices, I think Rubini said it, I read it in an email, I was in Georgia yesterday, the week before I was in for a day each in Beijing, Seoul, uh, Tokyo, uh, 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 Sydney, and Melbourne. That's a lot of uh, red eyes, trust me, you have no idea where the hell you are. Uh, where are we now? And, <laughs> and, uh, but but, but uh, that, this massive swing in, in prices, Rubini, uh, when, uh, uh, the NYU professor Rubini, who was the first guy to say we've got a trillion dollar asset quality problem when everybody else was measuring it systemically as a hundred billion. Uh, obviously he was more right than wrong, evil as his prediction was. He's calling for, uh, he's just drawing everybody's attention to the fact that price appreciation and what, what I'd call a relief, a psychological relief recovery in, in the stock market uh, is, uh, is way out of sync with the fundamental strength of the economy and the banking system. Where to now? Over time, junk bonds trade as an index, trade around four or 500 basis points. Over treasuries, uh, they tighten to an all-time uh, uh, tight spread to treasuries. The, the risk premium that you're paid to buy their securities came all, this is for the index. This includes triple C rated and, and single B minus rated junk bonds, the worst ones tightened to 240 over. When I grew up on Wall Street, 240 was a, a regular triple B uh, single A investment uh, return in the old days. So, so junk bonds had, begotten, had gotten too rich, people had gotten too optimistic is what that number says. It exploded to 21% to, to over treasuries, 2,100 basis points. And now it's rallied all the way back in. Prices have risen so much, the spread to treasuries is just 700 for the index. And that's with a climbing default rate. So that's still a pretty low number, tight number. Expect that to widen. 
global equity market meltdown. If you're into big numbers, we, we lost about 31 trillion of value uh, in the global stock markets. U.S. market, many others higher than our percentage. We're up 50 percent uh, in, in this year alone, the, uh, the stock market. Um, it's obviously important to get the for all of our, you know, the normal working of a capitalist economy to get back to normal government intervention, not this necessary long fingers thing that we've been living through. Uh, we talked about the Fed's balance sheet grew dramatically, uh, uh, and that has to get back down to something normal, whatever normal is, 900 billion to a billion one or so. And, that, and so if you watch that statistic, you'll, you'll get a sense of the government's confidence about when it's time, uh, as it's progressing, to get out of the, uh, the repair job that it's done so well. Uh, Re-establishing uh, securitization markets, they account for as much lending in the United States economy as the banks do. That's not true 50 years and 30 years ago. It's true today. It was true 18 months ago. Uh, today, securitization is a very small fraction uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the lending it needs to be to, to get the economy pumped up. You know, this is not a military comment, but it could lead to it. It's very important that the U.S. Uh, has trade policies and financial policies with China that encourage China to keep buying our treasury uh, bond issuance, which is an, obviously at an all-time record high, and we should obviously hope China has no military ambitions over the next 20 years. Um, SCAP is that, that, remember the 19 bank stress test thing to show that all the banking system is, is either completely dead or completely alive? If you're in the White House or the Secretary of the Treasury, do you lead a program like that publicly if you haven't rigged the answer? I mean, can you imagine the outcome being, oh, gee, whiskers, we just found out the whole banking system's uh, rotten, you know? <laughs> so uh, it, the, the, the regulatory framework does this continuously, just so you all know, right? So obviously, there's sometimes periods of slightly more slack, slightly more strict, but this is an ongoing thing. So I, I don't want to be too uh, uh, corny about it, but I think... This was a very well-orchestrated, very successful program to prove to America that you, you can relax a little bit. You can investigate. Things are okay. What, what bank needed 100% of its capital base raised? The worst of the 19 that needed a little caning in public. You know? GMAC. The bank had just converted, excuse me, the authorities had just converted it from a captive finance company into a, into a well-capitalized uh, bank holding company, right? It's now called Ally, A-L-L-Y. Uh, but anyway, it, it, uh, it needed to raise 100% more capital. What's the consequence of SCAP? Within weeks, because the government has sprinkled magic dust on it, 78 billion of new fresh capital was raised by those 19 institutions. That is success. I, I think that's fantastic. Without, in the absence of this sort of big red cape, you know, I, I don't think there would have been $5 billion raised. So this was a very, very, very good thing unless you look at the size of the problem. 78 billion. We need about 250 billion more capital in the banking system to get it healthy and bridge through this next period. But it was a necessary step. Why do I say that we've got to get the U.S. consumer habitually a zero-saving nation? You know, remember Japan in the 90s, early 90s, was running up at about 16, 19% consumer savings rates, absurdly high. And <clears throat> Japan, is a, bar, bar, federal borrowing by Japan as a percentage of GDP is one of the highest in the world, but it's okay because their citizens are buying it, right? They've got a very high savings rate. In America, you may not have noticed, but we tend to borrow too. Uh, the published number is about 12.5 trillion that, uh, of our debt. It's about 57 trillion if you put all, all the numbers in, Social Security, Medicare, and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to do that, but, but that's the real number. But, and we have no savings. The savings rate in America is a donut. We're, now we're up to five, we're from three through this crisis to four and a half to five. We're up on around 6% savings. And that's an index, inverted index of fear. People aren't spending because they're terrified. The average person is not comfortable with an, a 9.8% unemployment rate. The underemployment are the people who've stopped looking for a job. It do, they don't have a job yet. That number is about 9% too. There's almost 20% of Americans are unemployed right now. So I'm not surprised that the rates of savings has gone up. What does it mean for GDP? This country is driven by a 70% consumer spend level, is the engine of this economy. If we save, what does it mean for GDP growth? Pretty obvious, right? 
So we almost have to, now we've got the SCAP program, we've got adults and educated Wall Street buffoons to all believe that the world is, is cool and safe again in the financial sector. We've got to get that, that transition of confidence into the consumer sector too. And uh, lastly, uh, we've got to find a way to uh, uh, you know, take care of folding or removing uh, 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 the smallest number I, I can look at you with a straight face is four to six hundred banks. The FDIC is closing three a weekend, have you noticed? It's not two and it's not four, it's three a weekend. It's a staff bandwidth issue. They can't process them quicker. When, when, uh, when, when Milken took uh, Drexel away, the, and, and you know the SNL crisis hit and we had all those banks uh, uh, collapsing, the FDIC ended up with about 15,600 employees. At the peak of the optimism in the financial markets, when you'd think that the FDIC's reserves have to be the biggest because it, we're going to go the other way somewhere here, or how severe we don't know, but you'd think the FDIC reserves were going to be huge and the staffing up would be gigantic. They had 4,200 employees. So as this crisis hit, they had to go to their local high schools and recruit you know, intelligent. <laughs> they didn't have anybody. It was absolutely terrifying to see how uh, under under personal capitalized uh, Washington was to handle these things. And uh, we should all be very grateful that Hank Paulson, Bernanke, Geithner, that the caliber of people we've got there today and their educational background, especially Bernanke, in, you know, his PhD in, in, in studying the Depression. Without those people, I promise you, we would have had a meltdown you can't relate to. So on that happy note, let me take a couple of questions. <laughs> So uh, if you need to catch a train, please uh, leave quietly. We'll continue another 15 minutes sure. or so with, with Q&A. So, right. I think you were first, Jim. Mark, uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, about where, where we're going, uh, being, look at your crystal ball a little bit and look out. Uh, there's a lot of consensus discussion that inflation's going to uh, rear up and possibly get to double-digit in range of three to five years. Uh, the government's got a lot of refinan uh, constant financing to keep the deficits going debt service. Where does this put the private equity industry in terms of refinancing all the privatizations that were done in the last three or four years? Is there going to be crowding out? Sure. Is your plate going to just explode with opportunity? hope so. Okay. Uh <laughs> Can you kind of paint that picture? The, the, the sort of dual question is we've got it appears that the, one of the costs of this massive fix and the flooding of uh, keeping interest rates low, flooding uh, liquidity into the system, is that we ha have to have some form of, uh, of repayment uh, or payback, and, and that ugly penalty is likely to be inflation. How, how, how high and how soon is the real question, rather than whether we're going to have any. <coughs> we will have higher inflation. It's, it's, it's mathematically impossible <coughs> to avoid it. Um, and then the second thing is, in the middle of all that, are we going to have a sort of crisis in, in, uh, in, in available credit, uh, for, particularly for levered companies like the leveraged buyout community? Um, reversion to the mean helps a lot of things. So let me deal with the last one. There's been virtually no private equity deal done of any type for the last 18 months of scale. So, yes, we do have a tsunami behind us, but the water level is pretty shallow in the pool we're standing in now. So yes, while the economy is going there, we're looking here because this is where the prettiest mistakes are. That's correct. But there's look, I'm just dealing with financial, regular, you know, company stuff. If you look at the commercial mortgage gig, there's about 300 billion of maturities in each of the next three years, and most city rents are down between 20 and 40 percent for commercial space. Most big cities. So there's a second collapse of credit, or let's call it a cleansing, that has to go through the banking system. Yet, So I think in commercial real estate and in leveraged buyouts, uh, if there isn't enough confidence, we won't, the banks won't extend that credit. And there won't be enough confidence unless we get the securitization markets up because the banks aren't big enough to distribute that risk among themselves. One of the things I said a long, in, a long time ago this morning was that there were 13,500 banks uh, here in the States 30, 35 years ago. There never used to be a securitization market of any great scale. Lou Ranieri and a couple of youngsters like myself and Marty and I worked together. We created a lot of that funny stuff for credit cards and all that. And it was very lumpy. We called it segmented debt. 
You know, it was so primitive back then. It's grown to something very, very powerful now. Unless the markets pick up securitization again as a popular way to invest, there is going to be the crisis in the refinancing you talk about because the banks aren't willing to hold these instruments they're underwriting. It's not what they do anymore. They hold a piece of it, but they need to distribute to other banks and to these securitized pools. So there could be a bit of a crisis, but it's a crisis over time, not a, not a spike crisis like we went through. On inflation, one of our, is a German family I used to help, so it's not mentioned here, but I sat on the board of their little pharmaceutical company, urged them to sell it, because I, I can't count very high, but when you're north of a billion in, in net worth, you have a moral obligation to the next 25 generations to take half of that off the table in cash, right? Again, just simple math using, not the models, but peasant logic. So the, I, I tried to get him to take a billion off the table. He, he eventually said, you know what, I'm selling the private German company and the American public company, the whole thing. So we sold it to Novartis for 8.3 billion. They kept six. Here's a guy who's PhD in chemical engineering. His twin brother's a, a doctor. They, they have a few loose pennies to play around with. They have access to anybody they want with that kind of money. Very sophisticated guys. He called me three months ago. And he said, what is the chance we're going to have a 25% inflation by December this year in America? I, I give you the story to illustrate that you're asking a great question about inflation, but there will be a, there will be a rational increase in inflation over time. It's not going to be some, you know, I don't know, some completely spurious... Uh, there are minds that overreact to all this stuff for sure, but I, I think we should be prepared for good inflation. By the way, as a matter of banking or, or, or financial policy, most governments dig out of holes like this in their banking system by inflate by using the, uh, the, the lever, of, the help of, of inflation to uh, get your way out. So you want to own a home builder with good, right? With, with uh, good inflation, brings the price of the land up and we're just sitting on it right now. It's not going anywhere. Uh, and you want to own a bank or two. We own a little bank in, in, in Michigan. That may or may not survive. We don't know, right? We, 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 these are, I'm not suggesting these are good companies we're buying. Thank you. You, you a second. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... Do you think that the, the government can uh, pass new legislation or can do something with the SEC or whatever? Is the government really capable uh, of um, preventing this kind of thing in the future, the recession gone through? And if that's the case, do you think they can? Do you think they've done enough so far? Or what should they do? No, I think even with the best people in, in, in England or China or Italy, or I wasn't, that wasn't a... That wasn't a throwaway line. Uh, but in all the countries with, with financial discipline, I don't, I don't think, even with the best intentions and the best trained people, I don't think human behavior is controllable on, on a mass scale. Uh, uh, so meaning you can rely on recessions continuously for all time, and you can rely on expansions for all time. Can we, I think your real question is, can we do a better job of preventing completely uh, catastrophic 29s or, or, or 2008s. There's no doubt that uh, there's no doubt that we will improve the system. The Social Security didn't exist. The FDIC, that Fannie, Freddie, etc., didn't exist. Those are all uh, grandchildren of, of the uh, you know of the accidents of before. So similarly, we are going to see a clearinghouse in derivatives. We are going to see a capital requirement. Yes. So so there will be improvements, but. I'm not imaginative enough to figure out what the next high school kid is going to come up with on Wall Street that drives the positive insanity to a level that, that you know, all, we all fight yesterday's war is what I'm trying to say, and we solve for it. But I don't know what the next invention is we, we can't anticipate. So it's always the, the unimagined thing when it's small, it's never a, a big problem, so it doesn't get regulated up front. It's when it gets chaotic that... Uh, that people step in with a huge overreaction. Good to see you again. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And uh, making this Thanks, Mark, for a fascinating and also an entertaining Thanks. presentation. Some of our students are sitting here. Hope you had your seat belts fast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're seeing. Um, we want to thank Capital Preservation Partners for underwriting this series and also the Friends of Concordia for helping support the series. If you'd like to become a friend of Concordia and our non-climate, uh, the hogs are going to help you.